The next two discrete time convolution properties that we want to look at are the associative and time shifting properties. Let's start with the associative property. It says that I can take the quantity x convolved with h1, take that quantity and convolve with h2, or I can take the quantity h1 convolved with h2 and then convolve it with x. So I can put these parentheses and group discrete time convolution how I would like to. I can associate these pairs either way that I want and it's equivalent, so we need to show that. So the associative property of discrete time convolution. So let's start with the starting point on the previous slide, the quantity x convolved with h1 and then that quantity convolved with h2. So let's just write down what it means to do this. So by definition, x convolved with h1 is the sum from minus infinity to infinity, x of m, h1 of k minus m. That's just the definition of discrete time convolution. So I've, I've substituted that in, and I'm going to go ahead and leave the second part alone for now, convolved with h2 of k. So let's go ahead and get rid of the other convolution symbol, that star, and actually replace it with the, with the definition of discrete time convolution. So let's think about this. When I do convolution, what I do is I replace the symbol, that star symbol, with an infinite sum. So I have this new sum I've brought in, n equals minus infinity to infinity. And what do I do? I take the first term and I replace the time variable with my summation variable. So my summation variable here that I've brought in is n, and I need to replace the time variable in the first signal with it. Well, the time variable in the first signal is k. So here in this first sum, I'm going to replace the time variable with n, because that's what I do when I write down the definition of discrete time convolution. The very first signal that I have, and I replace the time variable with my summation variable. So that's what I've done. And then the second signal, when you write down the definition of discrete time convolution, you write down k minus the summation variable. My summation variable here is n, so I've written down k minus n. So I started off with the shorthand notation. I had two stars representing discrete time convolution, but I have replaced each of those with the definition of discrete time convolution, so now I have two summations. When I write down each of those summations, I have to use a different counter variable to have it be correct. So I now have this infinite sum of an infinite sum. Well, I can break that up a little different. I can get rid of the parentheses because we know multiplication is associative and distributive, so I can go ahead and do that. So now I have a double summation from minus infinity to infinity of n and m of this product here. Well, I'm going to go ahead and change the order of the sums. Instead of summing over n, then summing over m, I'm going to flip the order of the summations. And then since x of m is only a function of m, I can bring x of m outside of the sum for n. So I have the sum over m and then the sum over n here. And then let's go ahead and do a change of variable. Let's let this new quantity r equal to k minus n. So if r is equal to k minus n, I can rearrange that. I have n is equal to k minus r, just doing a little algebra there. And if I really want to introduce this new variable, r, to rewrite the sum over n, I need to replace all of the n quantities. So I know how to replace n. I'm going to replace n with k minus r. But I need to know how to replace the limits for the summation. So when n is equal to infinity, by looking at the equation for r there, r would be equal to k minus infinity or negative infinity. Also, when n is equal to minus infinity, r will be equal to positive infinity. So with these things here, I can rewrite my summation over n a little differently. Also, we're going to define this quantity z as just the convolution with h1 and h2. This will make our result here at the bottom be a, a little nicer. So all z is is just h1 convolved with h2. We'll see that pop up here in just a minute. So let's go ahead and replace the n variable with this new r variable that we've introduced. So the bottom limit, when n was equal to minus infinity, r is equal to positive infinity. And when n is equal to negative, positive infinity, r is equal to negative infinity, so I pop those in. And then the argument of the sum, h1, it used to be n minus m. Well, n was equal to k minus r, so now it's k minus r minus m. And then also h2 used to be k minus n, but that by definition is r, so we've replaced that with r. So I've gotten rid of all the n's and replaced it with this new auxiliary variable r, and you'll see why we did that here in just a second. That was the substitution I made, and that was the other substitution I made. So we can go ahead and rewrite this again. Instead of summing from positive infinity to negative infinity, 
I'm going to go ahead and sum from minus infinity to positive infinity. That's the way we usually write sums. Also, the multiplication, I can change the order of multiplication. So instead of h1 times h2, I'm going to write it as h2 times h1. And the reason I've written it like this is because now when I look at this term right here, this looks very much like a discrete time convolution sum. It looks like h2 convolved with h1, but not at time k, but at time k minus m. So that first argument there is usually what you write down when you write down the definition of discrete time convolution. So this looks just like h2 convolved with h1 of k minus m. But we know that we can change the order of discrete time convolution. We just we just proved that you can h1 convolve with h2 is equivalent to h2 convolved with h1. So I can rewrite that as h1 of k minus m convolved with h2, which is my z signal that I just introduced. This is just z of k minus m, where I've used the time shift property. If I shift one component of a convolution, then the result of the convolution shifts by the same amount. We're going to prove that here in a minute, but for now just take that as a fact that if I have a signal, z, defined as h1 convolved with h2, if I shift one of the components, say shift h1 to k minus m, well then z is also going to shift by the amount m. So that's the time shift property. So I have a sum over m equals minus infinity to infinity x of m times this signal z. So I've substituted that in there. But guess what? This itself is now just a discrete time convolution again. It looks just like x convolved with z. But x convolved with z is really x convolved with the quantity h1 convolved with h2. So we started with the quantity x convolved with h1, that quantity convolved with h2. We ended up with x convolved with the quantity h1 with h2. So we have shown that discrete time convolution is associative. So in showing that discrete time convolution was associative, we used the time shift property. So let's go ahead and use the, or show that discrete time convolution does have the time shift property. So let's go ahead and start with the quantity C of k equals h1 convolved with h2. By definition, that's the sum from minus infinity to infinity of h1 of r times h2 of k minus r here. I'm just using counting variable r instead of counting variable m or n like we normally do. So we'll need m and n here in a minute when we introduce the time shifts. And that's what we're going to do right here. h1 of k minus m. What is that? That is just h1 shifted by some amount m convolved with h2 of k minus n. So that's h2 shifted by some amount n. What we would like to show is this is actually equal to c of the, the signal c shifted by m minus m plus n. And that's what we're going to do right here. So let's go ahead and actually just write down by definition what h1 of k minus m convolved with h2 of k minus n is equal to. So that's equal to the sum of some counter variable from minus infinity to infinity of h1 of r minus m. So every time I write down convolution, the first signal that I deal with, I replace the time variable by the counter variable in my sum. Here, the time variable in h1 is k, so I've replaced k with r. So I've replaced the time variable with r. And then the second piece, you take the, what, the argument of the original signal, k minus n, and then you put a minus r, you add on kind of a negative time variable to it. So that's what I've done. All I've done is apply the definition of discrete time convolution to these time shifted quantities. And it's just important to keep track of which are time variables. Here, the time variable is k, in which are just numbers. The numbers are just m and n. They're just numbers. So now that we have this sum written out, let's do a change of variable to actually show that the time shift property is true. So let's let t equal r minus m. So if t is equal to r minus m, when r is equal to negative infinity, t is equal to minus infinity. When r is equal to positive infinity, t is equal to positive infinity. And I can also rearrange this equation and solve for r. r is equal to t plus m. So these things right here are what I need to replace in my summation. That's as written to get rid of all the r's. So to get rid of all the r's, I can rewrite my convolution. It's the sum now over t from minus infinity to infinity of h1 of t. Because remember, we let t equal r minus m. h2 of k minus n minus, and remember what r is equal to, r is equal to t plus m. So it's minus r or minus the quantity t plus m. 
I can rewrite that, h1 of t, h2, and I'm just going to rewrite this a little different. I'm going to cluster k minus m minus n in parentheses and then subtract off t. So we haven't changed anything. We've just grouped them and arranged them in a way that this is starting to look like a convolution in itself here, right? I have a sum from minus infinity to infinity of over t, h1 of t, and then I have some number minus t. So that looks like a, very much like a convolution. In fact, if I wanted to, I could go back to my original time variable r. So if I just let t equal r, it's just a straight replacement. I now have a sum from minus infinity to infinity of r, and this looks just like my original signal. If you go back up top and look at the definition of ck, that looks just like ck with k replaced by k minus m minus n. So that's exactly what we have here. What we have here is actually our original signal, but k has been replaced with k minus m minus n. So if ck is equal to h1 convolved with h2, if I shift h1 by m and I shift h2 by n, what results is my original signal shifted by m and n, by their, by their sum. So we have just shown the time-shifting property of discrete time convolution.